Father, I ask that you would bless us today in our giving. Um, Lord, and I thank you, Father, that um, it doesn't return void. Your word goes forth. It's like that seed that's sown forth, and it always produces a harvest. And we thank you, Lord, that we give, that it will be multiplied back to us. Good pressure, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. I'm almost losing my King James. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, so let's take a moment to give. Baskets at the front, debits at the back. All right. Very good. Well, why don't we stand for a quick minute as we open in prayer for our message today? Awesome. Father, we thank you for this word today that's going forth. Father, we thank you that um, we're going to be diligent to uh, do your word and by your grace be able to fulfill this in our lives. We ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So this, uh, you may be seated. This, uh, this year, this new year, last week I shared part one of a new year message uh, that I'm going to continue today. And uh, one of the things I brought up last week was that the verse for 2019 that I really felt God put in my heart was Isaiah chapter 43, uh, verse 18 to 19. And it says this, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. And, and many times that's what we do is we get stuck on the things of the past, what didn't work yesterday, what was a struggle in our lives yesterday, um, what we had to fight with yesterday and in the years past. And I think there's, as believers, we have to obey God's word and make a choice not to focus on the old. All right? Next verse says here, okay, uh, Behold, I will do a new thing. Uh, now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Okay? Um, the word new means it's never existed before. Something that's never existed before in your life, something that has never happened before in your life, God wants to do a new thing. And God wants to give us like a blank slate and say, listen, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to start all over again with you. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning, right? So we can come to the Lord every morning and God has a new, a new vision for us, a new plan for us. And many times we get stuck in the old and we say, you know, I just can't do it because I've always been this or I've always had this struggle. And God is saying, you know, don't think about the former things. I'm doing a new thing. And I don't know about you, but I want to believe that because I've got some baggage in my past. How many got some baggage in your past? And I don't want to be limited by that. I want to be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But in order to do that, i got to renew my mind the way I think. i got to get rid of some stinking thinking. You know what I mean? We have to have some positive thinking. You know, some of you, you got some history in your past, and, and, and every time you get put in pressure or a situation arises, you think, oh, here we go again. But I want to encourage you today that it's a new day. You can put the past behind you, and God can write a new story in your life. All right? So we want to have a blank slate, and we say, yes, Lord, to that. Okay? God wants to make a road in your wilderness. Wilderness is basically a neglected or abandoned area in your life that is not cultivated. There's some issues in your life. There's some, there's some overgrowth. There's some, a wilderness is a place where, where man hasn't got in and dealt with, right? It's just overgrown. And there's areas in our lives that are uncultivated, that need to be dealt with in our life. And, and we don't even know where to start, but God promises that he's going to make a pathway through our mess so we can go into the glory of God. Isn't that awesome? This is a great promise today. And then he says another thing. He says, I will make rivers in your desert. Maybe you don't have a mess in your life, but maybe you feel that you've been barren in certain areas of your life. Maybe you've been barren in the presence of God. You just remember times when you used to read the Bible and it just spoke to you and brought life to you. And now it's just like you read it and it's like a dried up newspaper. And you're just like, what's going on? There's dryness in my life. Maybe your finances have dried up. Maybe relationships have dried up. But look what God promises here. He says, I will bring a stream in your desert. Isn't that good news? Okay. 
And so God wants to bring a stream into areas of your life that are barren or have been barren in 2018 and before. God wants to do a new thing. Say, God wants to do a new thing. All right? And so we have to choose uh, to believe the word of God by faith. Right? The scriptures of God, the scriptures, the word of God is so important because um, uh, God honors his word above his name. That means that his word and, and, and people have moved away from the Bible and what the scriptures, and there's a lot of argument about what's the word of God and what's poetic and what's this and what's that. The word of God has been kept and handed down from generation to generation, the holy text. And when we go to the scriptures, the scriptures are basically the promises of God. How many know that? And, and the scriptures basically, the scripture is kind of like... Um, we had baskets up here, and they're full of money now, probably. So um, it's, like, it's, like a, um, it's like a basket here. Let's pretend this is a basket. Okay? And God puts the blessing into the basket, into the promise. So when you come in prayer and you say, God, your word says that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, and you hold up that, that promise, you hold up the promise, God puts the blessing in the promise. Because he honors his word and he's, he's there to fulfill his word and to keep his promises. That's why it's so important that we learn what the word of God says and we pray his word because God hears his word and goes, yes, I made that promise and I'm going to fulfill it. And that's why some of you get up and you say, Lord, I want a new red Ferrari or a Porsche. There's no verse or scripture for that. So God says, well, I don't have to fulfill that. So I didn't say I would give you that kind of thing. So I don't have to do it. In fact, I'll give you a Honda Accord because the disciples were all in one Accord in the upper room. So you get a Honda, right? Or God, he drove Adam and Eve out of the garden in his fury. So he's into Plymouths, but no Ferraris. Okay. Uh, anyway, I, I digress. So we'll go back here. But the just shall live by faith, the word of God. God puts the blessing in the promise. And that's why when he said to Joshua, he said, that he, he said, you need to take my word, be strong and courageous, do my word, believe my word, walk this thing out. And when he did it, guess what? He, he was told by God, go around Jericho seven times, right? Go around Jericho. And on the seventh day, go around seven times and blow the trumpets. And when you do, I will come and defeat, take down the walls of Jericho. How many know the story? All right. So God was able to put the blessing in the promise. All right. And so let's look at first uh, Isaiah. We're going to move on here to another scripture here. Um, talking about the word of God. There were some surveys done, or some, uh, yeah, survey that was done, and I got some statistics here. Um, I'm just going to read this to you. There's some sad statistics. Okay, small groups, uh, based on the research that's been done, a small group ministry is the key to combating and changing the epidemic of biblical illiteracy. There's, been, there's just an epidemic of biblical illiteracy in North America and even in Europe, okay? And because we don't read God's word, it follows that we don't know it. And to understand the effects, we can look at the statistics of another Western country, the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom Bible Society surveyed British children and found many could not identify common Bible stories. And when given a list of stories, almost one in three did not choose the nativity as part of the Bible. And over half, 59%, didn't know that Jonah being swallowed by a fish was in the Bible. Okay? British parents didn't do much better. Around 30% of parents don't know Adam and Eve. They don't know David and Goliath. They don't know the Good Samaritan. They don't know these stories are in the Bible. Okay? To make matters worse, 27% think Superman is or might be a biblical story. More than one in three believe the same about Harry Potter is in the Bible. And more than half, 54%, believe that the Hunger Games is or might be part of the Bible. Just telling you. Okay? And, uh, but it's more than simply not knowing the stories from Scripture. Our lack of biblical literacy has led us to a lack of biblical doctrine. And so doctrine is getting watered down. How many would agree? So LifeWay research found that while 67% of America's, Americans believe heaven is a real place, 45% believe there are many ways to get there, including one in five evangelical Christians. More than half evangelicals, 59%, believe that the Holy Spirit is just a force and he's not a person or a personal being. Okay? 
They, there's no teaching on the Trinity. As a whole, Americans included, including many Christians, unhold biblical views on hell, unbiblical views, sorry, on hell, sin, salvation, Jesus, humanity, and the Bible itself. All right? And so this is, this is an epidemic. All right? There is little excuse for anyone living in Western civilization, particularly Christians, to not own or read their own Bible. Nine out of ten American homes have at least one Bible. The average American Christian or not owns at least three Bibles, whether they're a Christian or not. The average American Christian uh, owns, sorry, I just read that. Technology is to put Bibles at our fingertip, and wherever we are, you can download a Bible on your, on your phone, Okay. So we, we, have, we have a real, real epidemic in North America and in European and British places, right? And so we need to come back to the Word of God. We need to know what the Word of God says. How many would agree with that? And so that being said, let's go to Psalm chapter 1, uh, verse 2 to 3. It says this, Psalm 1, 2 to 3. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never, never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Now, this is talking about the righteous. And so God has given, given us an analogy here of being a tree. The righteous being like a tree that's planted by the waters, okay? And um, the Bible promises here that if our delight... Delight means you actually enjoy it. If your delight is in the law of the Lord, in studying the word, and meditating it, meditating, which is basically studying on it day and night, it says that we will be like trees planted by the riverbank. Okay? That means that our roots go deep, okay, into the soil where there's lots of moisture. How many know sometimes this, the streams of moisture are a little bit further down? And so our, our roots go deep and they, they take up the moisture from the ground, okay? Um, many times when you go out and you do well digging, has anyone ever done well digging? Okay? You have to set a well, and, and you'll go down. Sometimes you only have to go 10 feet. Sometimes you've got to go 30 feet. Sometimes you've got to go 50 feet, 100 feet, right? Because you're looking for a stream. You're looking for a current of water so that you can bring that water to the surface. And it's like that with the Word of God. Sometimes when you're studying the Word, you have to go deep so you can find that stream that's going to feed your soul. Okay? And um, the Bible talks about meditation, which is a type of prayer. It means you're praying, you're seeking God, you're saying, God, would you speak to me with your scripture? Would you make it known to me? I had a, a friend of mine moved out to an area in Ajax, and it was a new, a new development area, and they built a bunch of homes there. But there was a problem. It was out in the country a bit, so there was no, there was no water. So all of the neighbors would drill wells, and they, 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 wouldn't get, they couldn't get water. They'd get a little bit, uh, but they'd have to take uh, trucks of water in from the city because they couldn't get enough water from the ground. So he didn't know. He built his home, and he tried to hit the well. The, he, dr he dug a well. He dug a second well. He dug a third well. He, could, he, couldn't, he couldn't find water. All right? And then finally, he, he got to praying, and he said, God, I need you. And he got into praying and seeking God and went into some deep times of prayer. And, and he really felt that God spoke to him and said, I need you to go dig over here. So he called the well company and said, I want you to dig right here. They said, but sir, we've tried so many times. No, right here. I just feel this is the place. And so they came down and they dug a well, went down there, and they, they, they hit a stream of water that was going through there. And there was so much water pressure that he was able to have water for himself, and he was selling water to all his neighbors because he was able to locate. Because, but see, what happened was he had to pray, and he had to seek God and say, God, would you speak to me? Would you show me where to go? And it's like that with the Bible. When we're reading it, if you're just reading it like a storybook, it's not going to feed your soul. But if you read it prayerfully and say, God, I want you to speak to me today. I want you to show me some promises. I want you to show me some areas where I have to realign my life. And you, you prayerfully say, God, will, he'll show you where the, the streams of water are. Isn't that good news? And so God wants us to locate those places. But we need to be willing to go deep. We've got to be willing to um, go. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 to 6 talks about that. Go to that verse, please. It says, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commandments. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. 
Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them with your whole heart as you would for silver. Seek for them like hidden treasure. Then you'll understand what it means to fear God and you will gain knowledge. For the Lord grants wisdom and his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Amen? And so we need to prayerfully read the word of God and ask God to speak to us. So the Bible says if our delight is in the law of the Lord, if we're willing to meditate on it day and night, the Bible says we will bear fruit in season. How many would like to bear fruit in season? All right. Well, God's word is good soil. We lived, uh, when we lived on Sydney Street, we had this, uh, that area of Sydney Street, it's built on old swamp land, right? And so the soil is really, really rich in minerals. So we would, we would plant a little garden, a few tomato plants, and we'd come out and be like hundreds and hundreds of tomatoes. It was just overgrown. I remember we were giving it away. We couldn't give it away fast enough because it was good soil. And now we live in Caring Place and it's all sand. And we, like, we spend all this money and we try to put all these plants in and we even put fertilizer and we, and Camilla comes in. I got a tomato. Look at this. Ah! Like, you know how much we paid for that tomato? <laughs> right? Because the soil's not good. We need good soil. And so if we're planted in the word of God, we will bear fruit in the right season. Our leaves will not wither, okay, which is really, really important. What is the purpose of a leaf? There's three things that a leaf does. Number one, a leaf turns the light energy into food, Right? And, and when the sun beats down on it, it takes it, he turns it into energy to feed the tree. That's pretty awesome if you think about it. And, and what does sunlight represent? In the scripture, it represents hard times. It represents persecution. It represents a tribulation. We'll see that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. It says, the seed that fell on rocky soil represents people who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Okay, but since they don't have deep roots, say they don't have deep roots. Okay, they don't last long. They fall away soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Right. So when problems come or persecution comes, they fall. Why? Because the the leaf isn't functioning properly. Right. So leaves leaves do that. The second thing a leaf does is a leaf actually breathes in carbon dioxide which is toxic to us, and breathes out oxygen, which is life-giving. If, we ha- if we're producing leaves in our life, this is what will happen. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 36, it says this, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. How do you do that? If you're a person who spends a lot of time in the Scripture, it becomes natural. Because you're rooted in God. You're grounded and rooted in the love of God when you're in the scripture. And what happens is, when people come and try to hurt you or persecute you, you can turn it around and love them back. And it really doesn't bother you anymore because you take what's toxic and you turn it into life-giving. That's what the leaf does. The third thing the leaf does um, is leaves also release excess water, much like sweat. So if you're a healthy tree and you're planted deep into the word, We see in Ezekiel chapter 47, it says, verse 12, Fruit trees of all kind will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown or fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be for the food, and the leaves will be for healing. And so what happens is when, when the tree is drawing up water from deep under the earth, the excess water begins to sweat out of the leaves. And I believe that the deeper we go into the word, the deeper we go into God, the more we're going to sweat. There's going to be an overflow of the anointing that brings healing to others. And if we become a people and a church that goes deeper in the word and lets the word touch us and change us and transform us and feed us, we'll begin to sweat it out and it'll be an overflow. We'll start seeing more healings. We'll start seeing more miracles. We'll start seeing more marriages healed. How many hear what I'm saying? Right? Say, I need to start sweating. <laughs> the Bible also says, whatever we do, we will prosper if our delight is in the law of the Lord. Isn't that good news? 
So what I'd like to do here is um, I'm going to call, uh, I have a panel of people that I'm going to call up here. Uh, so Alex, did you want to come up? And Neil. Um, who else did I invite now? I'm trying to remember. Allison. I was going to have you give your testimony there, Grace, as you're leaving. Um, you you come back, okay? No problem. And who else? Who else did I invite? Now I'm trying to remember. There was one more person, David. Come on, brother. So we got some different generations represented here. And so what I want to do is, um, Chris, can you just hand out some wireless mics for me, please? And we'll turn them on. Um, there's one thing to remember too, as we're studying the Word is there's two covenants or two promises. There's the, there's the old covenant and there's a new covenant. So if you're a newer Christian, it's very important to, to realize this, that an old covenant means uh, an old contract. And the new covenant is a new contract. So we can read the Old Testament. We can draw principles from the Old Testament. We can learn morality from the Old Testament. But we don't have to do everything the Old Testament people did because it's a different contract, different time. Does that make sense? For example, you don't go in your backyard after you've sinned and sacrifice the neighbor's cat on an altar of stone. <laughs> and you say, why would I do that, Pastor? And you would say, because the Bible says that you cannot offer an animal that has blemishes and my cat has spots. <laughs> so I'm going to use my neighbor's cat. Okay, I'm just kidding. This is, this is the old covenant. They would, they would take, a, they would take a, a, an animal without blemish and they would sacrifice it on the altar. We don't do that because Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Amen? So what I want to do is, uh, so saying that, is that we have a course here called the Purple Book that Peter heads up. You got one of those there. Let me see it. And so this is, um, for those of you, it's good for everyone, but if you're a newer Christian, uh, it's Biblical Foundations for Building Strong Disciples. And so this will help you uh, figure out and understand and discern the old from the new. It's a great course, and so if you want to go through that, talk to Peter. That will help you. But what I wanted to do is just ask you guys some questions, um, just so we can have some feedback. Um, and you know, and you guys might have questions after. But just, uh, how long have you been a Christian for, Neil? Sixty-five years. So we got, we got, so we got a general here. Let's give him a hand, right? Amen. All right. So, so some of the questions I have here. So, so the first one is, and I'll ask it. And if you feel you can, you can answer this question or want to, you don't have to. But how many? Uh, how long have you been reading the Bible? Was there a time that you went from reading to studying the Bible, uh, and what brought about that change, going from just reading it to studying it? I read it cover to cover when I was diagnosed with leukemia, um, and I did that in just over a week. Um, the Lord put such a hunger in me to read His Word that I'd never had anything like it before, and I don't think since, really. <laughs> that works. <laughs> um, and so I did that, and when I was going through it, I, the twenty-third psalm became my psalm because I was in a I was in a bad place. Uh, it was uncurable cancer, so there was no one ever survived it. But um, I I signed on to the Lord's program when I was ten through the Gideons. I don't know if any of you remember that little Bible, but I still have it. It's very dear to me. His word. I read in there that he was the father to the fatherless, which I was. I didn't have a father. So it meant a lot to me, an awful lot. And anyway, when I got sick and I read this Bible cover to cover, I, the 23rd Psalm just popped. There I was. And the other one was First John. They're not First John, but John, Big John. Um, the... He is the Word. And I knew at that time that I was in love with, with this. This is my study Bible. Um, and I was driven after, went through all that, the Lord started to really deal with me, and I dove into study. It's one thing to read it, and we all should read it, and we should continuously read it, because we need that renewing. 
but there's something else to study it. And I bought a concordance, and I, I bought a chronological Bible, and I bought everything I could get my hands on. But God led me to a church that had a Bible school as its covering. So we had all kinds of study helps and people to talk to at any given time. And they were very very centered, um, evangelical. And from that point on, when I started to study, the application of the word became dear to me. Because it was no longer just a history book. It wasn't just a bunch of stories. It wasn't just who he was. It was also how he acts in my life. And it was it was beautiful, and it is beautiful, and it's going to continue to be beautiful. I don't know where he's going to lead me in all of this, but I can tell you one thing. I love this. Amen. I love him. Okay. And he is the word. In the beginning... That's awesome. Amen. That's excellent. And that my next question to you was going to be, um, you know, it, has there been a lifeboat scripture for your life that brought you through a dark time? And you just share that was First John, and what was the and the twenty third. So that was kind of like that that stream that you just yeah, tapped yeah, into, right. and it brought you strength to go through that's the right. cancer and yeah. get victory. That's awesome. Um, I can see myself in the twenty third psalm. All of a sudden, yeah. there I was. Here's yeah. God. And here I am. Amen. And it, it, it was as real yeah. as it could be, be. Yeah. And only he can do that. That's right. That's right. And, and so it reminds us that the book, it's a supernatural book. Yes. And it, it can transform us. Did anybody else uh, want to share that as well? Same question. Was, was, was there a time when you went from just reading to studying and why and what did that look like? Um, is this on? No. You can use um, <clears throat> I know there, there was one time when I was, when I was 16 and, um, I basically, you know, we had just been at a, a youth conference and, you know, I just said, I want to live my life more for the Lord. And, uh, so I, I just made a commitment that I was going to take some time, spend less time, uh, playing some video games that I was playing at the time. And I'm just going to take some time and I'm going to, um, you know, not just read a quick chapter in a day, but I'm going to really dig in. I'm going to ask the Lord for understanding, and I'm going to worship with it. Um, and that, honestly, it wasn't like an instant change, but it was th that over time, like, really set the course of my life after the Lord. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, what has there been? Uh, did anyone else want to respond to that? Or go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Um, I'll try and make it concise. <laughs> um, as a kid, I was fortunate enough. Uh, I grew up in a time where they still had um, people who would come from the church into the schools in elementary school, and they put up the felt board and they do the Bible stories. And um, it would be great if we could do that today because I know that's where it started for me. I didn't know anything about Christianity. But I knew Bible stories. Fast forward several years later, partying, drinking, and all the rest of that, um, drove my life into the ground, and I sobered up when I actually came to the Crossroads Church 14 years ago. Um, and I started to live my life as a Christian. I started, opened up the Bible, and I started to take a look at what it had to say. And it, it did. It, it, it became alive to me. Um, but I didn't have discipline and I didn't have order and work started to take over in my life. Fast forward another 10 years and I found myself back into drinking, um, trying to deal with stuff. And so a couple of years ago, um, I ended up having to go into, some of you know, I had to go to Teen Challenge, a one year Christian rehab program, um, put my entire family up on, on the block and we put a risk out there and, and it cost us basically everything. Um, you like to the to the home, and so obviously I've known a lot of scripture over the years. I've known a lot about Christianity, but it was when I went away to TC. I mean, I'm, I'm 
I decided if I'm going here, then it's all or nothing. I'm going in to find out once and for all where I stand with God. What do I believe? Do I believe in this or not? And so once I got there, um, dove straight into scripture. And within the first month, two months, um, I kind of figured that would be the answer. But sure enough, that's exactly what I found out is this is all I ever had to do. And this was everything that was missing. For those of us who sit there and try and delude ourselves and tell ourselves that I go to church and I'm a good person, um, you know, I I listen to the stories and I try and live that, you're kidding yourself. It ain't going to happen because that's when the relationship started, was only through being in the Word. I think that it's awesome that God's spoken to you about our church, that Bible literacy, it's it's essential. Everything in my life, in the last two years, my Christian walk relationship only started in the last two years, and it took me having to go to a weight of Christian rehab and be isolated for a year, and in that though, there's relationship that I never knew existed, and it exists on a level, our God's a supernatural God, so don't be looking for it in a way that you can understand and comprehend, he's going to talk to you in ways you never knew, um, and so that's where I started studying. That's awesome. Thank you, Alex. That's great. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. What about you, Allison? Do you? Um, yeah. So when I was, I got saved when I was 15, and I was really zealous about God and zealous about reaching my friends for the lost and super, super excited about going on missions trips. And I love the Word of God, and I just was so excited about the things of God. But um, I never really transitioned from reading the Word. Like, I loved it. I was reading it, and I loved it. But I never really switched to studying until, actually, I went to Bible college. And uh, I think, actually, we took a course on that. Yeah, I have a book, How to Study the Bible for All It's Worth. It's pretty good. And uh, there it gave me a lot of the tools that I still use today to like really dig in. Like Neil said, I, I got a concordance and uh, just started really asking God, you know, searching the Holy Spirit, you know, what are you saying in this? And one thing that I've learned over the years is that the Bible is multi-layered. It, there's so much dynamic layers and integral parts it's it's like you know a stick figure trying to understand a sphere it's it's almost impossible but it's a treasure to seek it out that's very good great answer um so if i was going to ask you guys how do you study or process the scripture for your life for yourselves is there a way that you study i'll give you an example um no, some people will have like three different colored pens, for example, and they'll they'll underline maybe this is a red pen will underline a promise of God, uh, what God promises, and then someone will underline, uh, you know, with another color, this is my responsibility to inherit the promise or whatever. Or maybe, do anyone have any way of studying, or do you use a concordance? How do you study or process the Word of God for yourself? myself um, going into TC they had set ways that you would do that um, maybe Alex bring your chair over here because uh, you're right under the speaker and we want to hear what you have to say it's good stuff <laughs> right here there we go there we go um, but yeah so they had set protocols and what you studied and I started to learn about um, I knew about concordances but I didn't um, commentaries that was a big one to have Somebody else who spent a lot of time in the Word to give you insight um, as to certain scriptures, and then you could go and get a variety of insights into it and help you through that. Um, being that, I only really start like I read the Bible, but it's only in the last couple of years where I started to learn to read the Bible the way that God expects us to, not on my own schedule. And in that, He's revealed it to me. So I've kind of been all over the map as to how I study. Um, but what I found is critical is that there's one thing of knowing the word, which is what I used to do before. I went to university, you study, you try and get as much information shoved into you, memorize it, try and digress it and digest it. Um, but God's way is a little different. It talks about the knowing of the word and then, um, the revelation of the word. And that's when you spend, you read through. And you get the scripture, and that's the knowing. 
But then when God speaks to you, something about the scripture grabs you and then you stop and meditate and talk with God. And what are you saying? This is where the relationship happens. And then he will give you, and this is the part that I talk about as supernatural, is he will give you the revelation. He drops his truth into your heart and it completes it. And at that point, nobody can take that away from you. It's one thing to know the word and you can argue um, and have a dialogue, but... When God drops that revelation, in, it completes part of who you are. Um, so I guess the studying part for me, being that I've learned the world's way to study, going into um, this biblical way, I've looked really hard to try and make sure that I'm just trying to not reread over top of scriptures. I'm trying to let them get in deeper and take his truth on how things are to be done as opposed to my understanding of it and just let the, the Spirit lead as best as I can. Amen. That's awesome. Very good. A good answer. Anybody else want to respond to that, just the way you would study? Because, you know, for maybe some of the younger generation, uh, I find myself doing this. You can Google. How many know Google's not born again? So, you know, you can Google scriptures, right? Give me scriptures on love, right? You got all these scriptures. But, I mean, to really study old school style and really, like, any pointers there? Um, what I used to do when I first started is I had like six different color highlighters. And so if it was based on family, I think it was pink, uh, money was green. I had like, you know, promises were in blue. And I, so I had all these um, uh, things on sanctification, especially were orange and stuff like that. But uh, as I continue in my study now more, what it's like, I really love my Amplified Bible because it's sort of like the Strong's Concordance mashed with the King James, New King James. So you get a whole bunch of scriptures at the end of a lot of scriptures that kind of let you rabbit trail if you want to, which is nice. But um, what I do now, sometimes what I do is I like I take a, a scripture and say it's full of promises. So I might take that and I might pray those promises for myself. You know, thank you, God, that I am the righteousness in Christ Jesus. You know, like a, you, you pray those things over yourself because, you know, it's the word. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'll be reading something, and it's like Alex said, it's supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit who makes it alive. He he gives you that rhema word, which is that revelation in your spirit. And so sometimes I'll be reading through a passage of scripture, and I'll be like, hold on a second. And I'm like, flip, 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 flip. There it is. You know, and you see something, and you like make those connections. Those are my favorite. <laughs> and then I'm like, Chris, Chris. <laughs> I had to call him, you know, I just, you know, saw this in scripture today, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, um, so that's really exciting, I like that, and then other times, you know, I'm praying, and I'm asking, you know, God, I'm going through this really hard time, like, I need a scripture, but because I've spent time reading through scriptures, I find it's easier for the Holy Spirit to bring those up to me, because if all I ever read was John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only one son, you know, and, and I'm going through this really hard financial time, like, God, I need a scripture, and John three sixteen pops into my head, because it's the only one I know, I'm like, not really cutting it right now, so it's good to read through everything, and then go back and study it, there's so many amazing study guides, um, the Old Testament sometimes can be big and scary, because there's so much happening in it, that you're just like, what is this, but there's so much good things, if you see it through the lens of the cross, and actually we just talked about this at youth group, uh, lensing your life through the cross, so seeing your life through the cross, you can see Jesus all through the Old Testament, you know, the completion of his covenant is, is the New Testament, and if if what we're reading and we're like, okay, now how does this relate back to what Christ has done, then it's a really usually a good place to start, I find. There are many ways to start. Am I? Oh, okay. Just not close enough. Um, many different ways to study the Bible and, and different things that you might study. Um, you can look at an overview. How does this, how do all these 66 books hang together, for instance? Because they do. They, they all don't compromise one another. They all reinforce one another. And it's important to get that, of course, and it takes a lot of study. Um, but also, like I've been studying the book of Psalms for about a few months right now, because I want what's in that book in me, okay? And that's the only, that's the best way of starting to get it in. But the other study that I do is that every, 
thing that I choose to do every day, I say, Lord, is is this the right way? He's in me. I don't I don't have to just go and look at this all the time, but I can talk to him. He's right here with me. And he's as much a part of whatever it is I'm being confronted with as mm-hmm. as I am. Mm. And he wants me to walk in the right way. So I just talk to him just exactly like that, just as if he was right beside me, right here in my shoulder. I say, Lord, I, I need a I don't get this at all. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I don't get an answer. So I just stop. I don't do anything. I don't make that choice That's awesome. until I hear. Because it's and sometimes, most often, two two places I'll either wake up with it or I'll have it in the shower. <laughs> that's awesome. That's <laughs> Which is awesome. Fairly close in time. <laughs> but the reality is that's how he chooses to do it. Right. He knows why. Doesn't matter to me. I just want to be secure in the fact that he's gonna answer me. He's gonna give me that answer. That's awesome. And so I study it several different ways and I have those things all going on simultaneously because he'll often use my study in Psalms for something I've been confronted with, okay? And I think that's what Allison was saying too. Like, the more you're in the Word, the more it feeds back to you because it comes quickly to your mind. But the reality is I have it on my phone. I don't, obviously don't carry these when I'm going through the day. But... When I'm in my car, I'll say, Lord, I want you to keep this car. Uh, it's a good car. I don't need a new one, but I want you just to keep it in good repair for I talk to him like that, okay? Because I want him to be every bit that part of it that I can get him into. Yeah, he's central and to everything. He's yeah. central to everything that we do. Amen. Go ahead, David. Yeah. I think... You're on. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, just turn this down. <laughs> okay. Um, I think there are kind of two ways that I approach studying the Bible. Um, I kind of alternate between the two of them, or I'll do both of them. Um, But one is kind of going through larger portions of Scripture to kind of get a big picture understanding. Um, I was recently just in a Christian internship where we read through the entire Bible cover to cover in five months, and... That was really cool, just, you know, that's obviously not very practical in the real world, but in that season it was really cool just to read it at a quicker pace to be able to see the whole narrative of the the story of God right from the beginning to the end. Um, Because the Bible really is just a whole, um, just the story of God at work in humanity. It starts when he created us, how he redeemed us, you know, and it ends with him returning for us. Um, so I think that's a really beautiful way of studying the Bible. Um, and I also really like to take smaller portions of Scripture that the Holy Spirit is breathing on and just focus in on that, that one verse, that one line, and just, you know, ask the Lord to give me more revelation, uh, you know, praying it, singing it, reading it, um, just really getting it into my heart. Um, and I think whatever I'm doing, whether it's a large portion, whether it's a small portion, whether it's in the middle, I always want to ask for um, just for the Holy Spirit because like, the goal of reading the Bible isn't to get more um, just theological information in our minds, but I want to know Him more. That's the, that's the whole reason why God gave us His Word is so that we could know Him. So. That's excellent. That's a good point to end on. That's good. Let's give them a hand for coming up. Thank you guys so much. Just If you don't mind just putting your mics back, turning them off, that'd be great. Thank you guys so much. Um, we're going to close in just a minute. I just have, I have a two-minute video to show. But um, before I do that, um, I had some little scripture reading booklets. We're sitting over here. So did someone take those, those little pamphlets? The prayer team moved all the chairs, so are they over there? We got them. Bring them up here. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I mentioned that I was ordering Read the Bible through one uh, in one year, uh, little booklets. They're $3 each. 
Uh, it, they cost me three dollars. I'm charging three dollars. Just, but what it is is a little booklet, and it takes you through the Bible in a year in chronological order. Most Bible reading plans don't do that. They just give you scriptures from all over the place. This takes you chronologically through so that you can say, okay, I understand the timelines and I can see how this comes together. So um, the books aren't in yet, but I did want to keep my promise by giving you guys something today. So this is actually the um, the reading plan for January. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to use it. If you want to pick your own Bible plan, you can do that as well. But this is what I would, this is what I'm using right now. And so uh, I would say start on the day, like if it's, what's the date today, the 11th? 13th, my goodness. Start on the 13th and go through and then go back and read those later because you'll get discouraged if you try to catch up, okay? But, um, so I'm going to just um, have these maybe in the cafe sitting on the blue table. So if you want one, please grab one and uh, make a commitment this year to be committed to the Word in a time and a season where people are, you know, not reading the Bible. Make a choice today that I'm going to be one who reads the Bible. Amen. And so I'm going to leave that. And take them for your kids, too. I'm bringing these. My kids don't know this yet, but they're getting one today, too. And they all love reading, so this is not a problem. All right, so we're going to watch this video, and then we're going to close. This pastor taught me how to read the Bible for myself. He didn't just say, here's what it says, do this. But he says, no, read it yourself. And the reason why that was such a huge gift is because... For the last 30-something years, I've been doing that almost every day. I became a Christian when I was 20 years old because I found Jesus so compelling and so amazing. And so I'm a new Christian. I read the Bible from cover to cover, and I am lost. I mean, just totally lost. And so one of the greatest gifts that anyone ever gave me was a teacher who taught me, first of all, to see how every book of the Bible fits together as a unified story that leads to and points to Jesus. And the message of this story and of the scriptures is so profound. I've had like the most meaningful times where, oh, this is what it actually says, and I've, I've made major life decisions where no one else is around, just me and this book. He also taught me how to read the Bible for myself, to gain skills, to gain confidence, just practical know-how about how to read an ancient book that is God's word to me still today. And it bothers me because I go, man, nowadays I don't hear about people getting alone with God or alone with the Bible. All I hear is about, oh, this speaker or this religious leader. And I'm going, man, don't you ever just get alone? I mean, this is where the... The, the impossible happens. There's something about the story of the Bible. Once you become comfortable and, and learn how to live and read in its world, all of a sudden these stories that seem so bizarre and strange, they become profound insights into day-to-day -day life and family and what it actually means to follow Jesus. I think, you know, what would the church look like if everyone, like everyone in there that showed up on a Sunday morning, actually spent the whole week, every day, alone with God, having these experiences, and then they come together, like that would change everything. Amen. Awesome. Well, why don't we stand and we're going to close in prayer. Amen. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time together, Lord, and We've been challenged by your word. We were challenged by uh, testimonies as well, uh, God, that we were, we're going to make a decision in 2019 to just get in your word more, God. I just pray that you would lead us by your spirit. Again, it's not for more information as much as it's to get to know you in a deeper way, Father. So I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in every life here today. In Jesus' name, help us to be to fulfill your word and to uh, study your word and, and, and uh, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 One of the things we saw here, which was really cool, is that how many notice that everyone here studies the word in their own way? So there's no fixed way. It's just that you spend time in the Bible and spend time in the word.